This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, to the thought and to debate, brought to you by the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. I am Gilad Halpern. And I'm Dalia Shenlin. I'm your co-host together with Gilad, and we'll be talking every week about interesting literature and research that's captured our attention. Our guest today is an assistant professor of Bible at Herzog College and the Matan Institute in Jerusalem, and the author of... Ruth, From Alienation to Monarchy, which recently came out in English by Magid Books. Dr. Yael Ziegler, hello and welcome. And proper disclosure, she is also my cousin. Thank you for having me. and It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for being on the show. So let's um, ask you, first of all, about what it's like to be an academic studying Bible through critical literary theory and methodology, but you're also a believer. Is there any sort of contradiction or do the two kind of complement each other? What's the experience like for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. I would say until around the 80s, until around the 1980s, it was hard for a religious person to study Bible in an academic setting. Some of the assumptions were blatantly contradictory to a lot of the religious beliefs, and um, it was not a very friendly place for a religious person. What happened in the 1980s was very interesting because the study of Bible went in somewhat of a new direction, uh, pioneered or spearheaded by people like Robert Alter or you know, Barafrat, Shimon Barafrat. And, and some of these people were looking at the, the, the Bible from a literary perspective, and they were using all sorts of tools that were often used in studying literature and applying them to the Bible and seeing whether or not we could mine the Bible for some of their deeper messages by using some of these literary techniques. And um, some of the assumptions that accompanied this research were very much uh, able to cohere with a religious person's assumptions. As opposed to what happened before that? What was going on before that that made it what you called sort of a hostile environment? Well, so what was what was the assumption when people approached the Bible was that it was written by uh, several different authors and therefore the attempt was to try to do some sort of historical criticism or biblical criticism, which was to see which authors wrote which sections of the Bible and with which political inclinations or, or what were what were some of their interests in, in writing the Bible. And because my assumption was, well, twofold. One is that um, the Bible, for me, certainly the Torah, was written with divine inspiration. So it was, you know, the whole question as to which people wrote the Bible under which circumstances and with which political um, interests or goals was not necessarily my first question or the most relevant question. And at the same time, I, I think that the assumption that there was no large your text, right? There's some sort of meaning that brought the whole story together was also one that was uh, that was troubling. Did you ever feel like you, you were um, forced to choose sides? I mean, because it is, I mean, the academic setting does require a certain critical distance from uh, from the text that you as a, as a believer is perhaps uh, not really inclined to do. But you, you did say that it is part of your exploration nonetheless. I mean, did th- this tension ever come to the fore? Were you perfectly happy that you've uh, managed to reconcile the two? Well, okay, I guess it depends when, when you're talking about it. When I was writing my master's, for example, I decided not to write about the Bible, probably for a lot of these reasons. And I wrote on, on a, uh, actually an anonymous work uh, written by someone who they call pseudo-philo, right, who was writing about the Tanakh, writing about the, the Bible. And I guess that part of that choice was a little bit of avoidance, <laughs> avoiding the issue. Um, and by the time I actually was writing my doctorate, I was writing about uh, the Bible. I wrote on the ro- the literary role of the oath in biblical literature. And yes, certainly there was, you know, I had to make all sort of references to books and and scholarship that I didn't necessarily find myself in agreement with some of their assumptions. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm certainly not afraid of of reading or of internalizing some of the ideas. My starting assumptions are different. When it came to the book, and I assume that's sort of where you're leading to, when it came to the book, there were 
certainly decisions that I had to make that oftentimes were a choice between my religious beliefs and some of my um, academic things that I was reading in academia and more when it came to attitude than to actual application of ideas. I made a very um, a very clear decision that I was more interested in writing something that was finding theological meaning in the story than in writing something that had critical distance. So now, that before, I want you to give us the examples of this, but why don't you tell us about the Book of Ruth and your Book of Ruth? Why did you choose this story? I mean, there's so many biblical stories. You had a whole PhD um, on a different biblical theme altogether. Why Ruth? So this is a good question. A lot of people ask me this question. Well, so I'll start with maybe the technical, which is that Ruth is a very short book. And, <laughs> and, and no, but I mean, I... I My I, favorite I, because, kind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it's a short book, and therefore you can really look at it from a bird's eye perspective, and you can really get sort of a handle on it. And when you when you look at this book, and, you know, my grandfather uh, said to me, how can you write 500 pages on four chapters? <laughs> so you, you've really um, turned a short book into a very long book. And that's when I think, well, you know, had I written on, you know, the book, of, uh, I don't know, the book of Judges. It was just 21 chapters. One can't imagine how, my, how big but the But that's also a little, a little bit like saying, how can you write all that commentary and halakha and mishnah and, and, and Talmud on one Bible? I mean, we have the Bible and then we have everything else, all right. the other types of Jewish literature. Nobody complains about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but except that I really, because I like to be comprehensive and because I like to show both breadth and depth, I felt that it was it, it was more doable in, in a short book. Um, it's also a beautiful book. It's a book that is inspiring. It's a book that is not, um, I guess I guess you would say it's not the way people typically think of the Bible as, you know, books that have lots of miracles and all sorts of dramatic um, uh, events that are taking place. It's really a book about nice people who are doing not extraordinary things, but extraordinary acts of kindness to each other. And there's something very inspiring about about that. You, you know, you really are able to uh, feel that the characters in, in, in this book are inspiring you to be a better person. And I, I like that very much. And, and also the, the fact that the protagonist is a woman. Yeah, that definitely helps. Was that, was that part of what drew you to the book? I don't think so. Oh, no, it didn't. I so. Oh, no. I, 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 <laughs> read, read from what ah, that's very interesting. Okay, so maybe we can discuss it later. Changes because, everything. Yeah, because I yeah. was under the assumption that this was really one of the main themes. I mean, the underlying themes that guided you throughout your exploration. I'm so disappointed to hear that that was <laughs> oh, totally wrong. I'm not disappointed wrong. at all because there's so many other interesting things about this. But yeah. it is unique in some ways because it is a story about so many nice things happening to so many nice people. No great big grandiose miracles like you said but maybe that's partly because maybe partly why the what what stands out about the book is how unusual it is to have a story in a religious canon of everybody being nice to each other well i would correct that assumption actually okay. um i think a lot of people do feel that that's what um, that's what what sort of predominates in the book of Ruth, and it's true because the main characters, the two main characters, Ruth and Boaz, are extraordinarily selfless. It's not just that they're nice; they're selfless, and that's uh, well. I'll say two things about that. One is that I think that that's not necessarily the kind of niceness that we are that we expect from each other, um, or that we expect from ourselves. And and I think that that's correct. We don't expect, like for example, you know when Root first offers to go with Naomi and not to return to her family in Moab, but to go with Naomi back to, to Beit Lechem. And Naomi says, well, if you come with me, you know, there'll be no future for you. There'll be no husband. There'll be no children. Go home and get married. And Ruth says, no, no, no. Wherever you go, I'll go. And, you know, where, it's how, really the most famous passage yeah, in the entire book. Yeah. 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 And, but, but what she's really saying is, is I'm giving up my future for you. And and the similar kind of act takes place at the end of the book where, you know, Root has a baby, gives the baby over to Naomi, who's lost everything, right? And of course, Root's entire raison d'etre is to take care of Naomi. And she gives this baby to Naomi, and then she disappears from the book, right? Root never reemerges. So the kind of selflessness that is going on in the book is one that's, it's not just that it's extraordinary, it's that I think it's not a model. It's not a model for, for that I want necessarily my children to follow or my students to follow or that I expect for myself. And therefore, what I think Root is really about is a model of leadership. 
And so we don't expect that kind of selflessness from our, our everyday interactions or our friendships. Not only do we not expect it, we, we also, I think, are a little bit troubled by it. But we do expect it and I think need it from our leaders, especially when you're trying to create a monarchy, which, I mean, you know, is not something that we have very much in, in our in our uh, society today. But, you know, in ancient times when a monarch was perhaps the most effective type of leadership, it was a very dangerous proposition because you give a monarch all of the power that's concentrated in his hands, the treasury and the military and the judiciary. And then you say, and now don't become corrupt, right? Which, of course, you know, I mean, we know power corrupts and Lord Byron, right? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And then, you know, you have this person who has this sort of inclination towards viewing themselves only as a conduit to helping someone else. And don't we wish that all of our leaders were like that? Don't we? But we also cannot help but think of the leaders today. Since you've raised the issue of leadership, I mean, this is set in a time when the Jewish nation is sort of in crisis, right? And, and, And in this story, you argue, if I understand you correctly, that tikkun is sort of the response to the crisis and maybe that this kind of leadership is a leadership of tikkun. Where are they and where are we now? Yeah. Well, I, you know, there is it, oftentimes I get a phone call from a parent who is learning the book of root for their child's with their child for their bar or bat mitzvah, and then they'll say to me, you know, and and what is the message of the yeah. root? Which is, you know, kind of a uh, you know a typical question. It's a hard question to answer, but what I try to answer is what I think is a good message for a twelve or thirteen year old. But I think it's also a good Are you message. Treating, you think we're like twelve? Or no, 13 no, no, year olds no, 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 no. But I, I still yeah. think it's a good. I still think it's 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 a good answer to your question as well, which is that um, it's the the book of root is really about the power of individuals to change a society. So you have, and that's what I started saying this before, and I actually went off course. And that is that you said to me, everybody's being nice. And I said, oh, no, that's not true. And then I didn't say what I really meant to say, which is that all of the minor characters in the story, the whole background of the story, are people who really belong to this very dysfunctional era of the judges, in which there's a lot of disloyalty, there's a lot of um, suspicion of the other, there's a lot of xenophobia, there's uh, you know a, a real sense that society doesn't uh, work together for the good, not of the whole or of the other. Um, and you see that in the background of Miguel Root as well. So once again, it comes back to that same idea, which is that you have this society where everybody is functioning dysfunctionally or is not functioning. And then you have Root and Boaz, who really, through the power of their own determination and kindness, are able to begin to shift the trajectory of society in a positive direction. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think that's an extraordinary message. For, for Bar Mitzvah and for us. Yeah, yeah. Of course. No, I, <laughs> I, I, I'd like to ask you something that's slightly more technical or methodological, and that is really, you just mentioned that it, it, it's set in a period that is parallel to the Book of Judges, and uh, part of your exploration has a comparative element to it. Uh, now, comparative studies are normally very helpful in social studies, as the person sitting next to me uh, uh, would uh, uh, passionately argue for. But I want to ask you, with concrete examples about uh, the, the Book of Ruth and the Book of Judges, how useful is it for uh, Tanakh studies? Yeah, I think that this is one of the answers to the question of why this book is so long, why my book is so long. <laughs> because I do think of um, sort of, uh, you know, like all the, all, the whole Tanakh is, is the whole Bible is one canon, right? So that there's a lot of conversations that are going on between books. And certainly when it comes to the book of Ruth and the book of Judges, where the historical setting is identical. So they're, they're, they're talking to each other. Now, actually, from a traditional perspective, the author of the book of Ruth is is Samuel, right? And the author of Judges is Samuel. And so the idea that these two books are talking to each other emerges even from that traditional idea. Uh, what way do we see it? Concrete examples. So I'll give you I'll give you a few. The first thing that I think that we have to say is that we have to note is is that the, the last verse of each of these books are parallel or contrast to each other. So how does the book of Judges end? It ends in utter chaos with the words, Bayamim ha'heim ein melech b'Yisrael, 
In those days, there's no king of Israel. I would venture to say there's no strong centralized leadership. There's no, I would say, um, leadership of integrity, right? Um, and, and therefore, there's chaos. Everybody does whatever whatever is right in their eyes. And we know what they do because there's collective rape of a concubine in Giva, and there's rampant societal dysfunction that's going on. Whereas when you look at the book of Ruth and you look at the last pasuk, it's Vishai Holid et David. It's Jesse gave birth to David. And we've launched the solution for the period of the judges, which is a period of leaderlessness and particularly kinglessness. And here, Ruth ends with the birth of David, who is the ideal leader in in many, many senses. And of course, therefore, he launches the monarchy. But this is so interesting how the Bible works. There's like these open questions, these these themes that are proposed unresolved, and then some other part of the Bible will answer and resolve it. But in this case, it happens because she gave birth to, she became the grandmother of David. But it's not the birth itself. It's something about their actions yes. that lead to this. Yeah. Can you characterize those actions? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I would say the book of Judges is characterized by increasing primary loyalties, right? There's an, an increasing sense of, I don't belong to a nation, or I don't belong to a city, I belong only to myself. And and that is that finds expression in, um, in, in, well, I guess, refusal to come to war when they're being called. So, I mean, really, at the very beginning of the book of Judges, Devorah calls all of the tribes to come uh, join in this, in this, you know, in this uh, uh, military situation. And, and people just don't come. Why don't they come? Well, you know, they're busy. Ruvain's busy with his sheep. And, you know, I mean, that, that's what she says. And, and, um, and, and other ways that this finds expression is in the refusal to give food to each other. So we have this one, I think, very very poignant and, and troubling scene with Gideon in the eighth chapter of the book of Judges, where Gideon is fighting on behalf of the people. He's fighting Amalek and Midian, and he crosses the Jordan with his troops, and it's an exhausting day, and the people become very hungry. And so he sort of knocks on the door of the city of Sukkot and then the city of Penuel, and he gets the same answer. They say, why should we give your your troops bread? Have you completed the war? Did you did you bring us a victory? And it's an amazing thing. You know, I think to myself, first of all, if, if anybody would knock on my door and ask for food, I would give them food. I mean, I would hope that I would have the means to be able to help the other. But but uh, that's part of being a human being. Certainly when you're talking about somebody who is fighting on your behalf. And sometimes I think when I when I when I encounter that scene, I think about, you know, when they go on the radio, you know, two years ago when we were uh, in, in Aza, when when our soldiers were in Aza and and everybody was just driving down with trunk trunks filled with food and then on the radio they said stop bringing food we have too much and and you know then I look at that story and I say what does it take for somebody to say I'm not going to give food to another and that situation spirals out of control to 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 and brings us to the final situation of the book in which there's a total breakdown of any sort of um human interactions you know, where, where, where you have this man who's traveling with his concubine and they get to give a and they're lying in the street and nobody you know nobody invites them home and finally when there's this you know elderly man that walks by and and, and invites them home and they say uh, well you know, don't worry we have food you don't even have to feed us and and what transpires from there is a society that is like Sodom and, and Gomorrah, Yeah, it's right? actually a painful scene to read in the book. Yeah. It's a terrible yeah. scene. So I mean, in your book. Is anything of that echoed in, in the book of Ruth? And if uh, not, what is really the reason for the big differences? In, in the, in the yeah. approach, I mean, in the whole attitude, as you said. Yeah, so that's uh, the question I wanted you to ask. Yeah. That's the right <laughs> question. In, in Miguel at Ruth, you, do, you have the exact opposite. You have extreme loyalty, Right. You have loyalty even where you don't expect loyalty. The daughter in law who says to the mother in law, no, I'll come with you. I don't want any future. I just want to come with you. Right. You have a lot of giving of food. Yeah, I was thinking right? about that. The giving of yeah. food is such a big theme in Ruth somehow. But I didn't really understand the meaning of the theme until you talked about the. See, this yeah, is, this is it may be something difficult for a secular reader. You have to know so much so many of the other contextual aspects, yeah. which is which leads to another one of my questions. Well, wait, I don't I just, want to interrupt I just, exactly. you. Exactly. No, no, no. no, no, no. no. Okay, we'll I'll get let to you that finish. in a second. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, but how do you account for this very different? OK, uh, this is. Yep. the right question. Okay. <laughs> so, so wait, I, would, I just want to say one more thing before I yep. say how I'm going to account for it. And that is that there's this, um, 
there's a sense that, you know, the giving of food, it's not happening across the board. It's not the people of Beit Lechem are not giving Naomi food, right? Naomi comes back to Beit Lechem and, and they're not giving her food. But um, what, what I think ultimately underlies the difference of uh, Boaz and Ruth who turn around the whole trajectory of, of the society, it, it lies in the word lahakir, right, to recognize. That word appears three times in Megillat Rud. And the first time that it appears, um, Rud is, it goes to Boaz's field. And she gets there, you know, and, um, and he says to her, you know, don't leave, stay. And, and, and he goes out of his way to treat her with kindness and with dignity. And he says, and you'll stay and you'll, and you'll pick and, you, you know, you, you can drink. And, and, you know, he gives her even uh, a meal for lunch, which is, you know, entirely unexpected. I mean, he's a wealthy landowner. He doesn't owe her a meal, but he goes that extra mile. He sees that she is having a hard time and she falls on her face and she says, Madua matzati chen be'inecha lahakireni. Why did I find favor in your eyes that you you recognized me? And then a second time, when she, when Ruth comes back to Naomi at the end of the day with an armful of food, and Naomi says, "Right, who is you know he um, makirech uh, baruch?" Um, he says, "Let the one who recognized you be blessed." And I think what we get a sense is is that in this period, there's a lack of recognition of the other. And and one of the ways that this finds expression is that at the end of the book of Judges, there is a plethora of anonymous characters, right? So you have a man, you have his concubine, and you have her father, and you have these sort of anonymous people that aren't bringing them in, and then you have the elderly man and who comes back and invites them in, and you have all these people without names. And when, I mean, the Tanakh knows how to, the Bible knows how to give people names, why Why do you have all these unnamed figures? And I think that one of the answers is, is that what we have here is the uh, depiction of a society in which people don't see each other. They don't see each other as being people, as having names, as being worthy of the basic rights of human beings. And when you have a society like that, when there's no recognition in society, so then y- you turn a person from a name into... I hate to make a Holocaust reference, but into a number, right? You know, we're a couple of days after Yom HaShoah. And then you don't have to give the person food and you don't have to give them basic dignity. And what happens with Boaz is, is that Boaz sees a human being. I will say one more thing about Miguel Rud in, in, this, in this context, and that is that if there is really one sentence that encapsulates the goal of the Book of Ruth, it's to restore the name of the dead person upon his inheritance. And what happens, of course, is that uh, the, the family of Naomi— they die out very quickly, right? Or very quickly in a textual sense, right? They die in the beginning. And Naomi is left in this limbo state where she has obviously no economic resources, but she also is being threatened with being cut off. Nobody to carry on the family name. Yeah, no one to carry on the family name. And the extraordinary moment, and this is another, I think, and this is really, I think, the critical turning point of uh, the Book of Ruth, is when Ruth goes down to the threshing floor uh, in that sort of suggestive scenario uh, to Boaz in the night, and she lies by her his feet. And, you know, there is something very suggestive, both about the language, the semantic field that accompanies that story, and what actually happens. She uncovers his feet, and she lies next to him. And it's clear that it's a sexual suggestive scenario and um, he wakes up in the middle of the night and he becomes very very fearful and he turns to her and he says Mi'at it's an amazing thing this woman has come in the middle of the night you know sort of almost offered herself to this man and he says to her who are you as opposed to what as opposed to sleeping with her, right? And instead, he says, who are you? And he gives her the opportunity to state her name. And state her identity. In other yeah. words, he gives her identity before he does anything to her to objectify And then he her. doesn't, right? right? And then he says, okay, you know, let's, let's figure out your situation right. and how we can deal with your future in the most humane way possible and how we can, you know, how we can restore to you not just your basic rights in terms of food and, and, and marriage and future, but also in terms of human dignity. But what I find interesting about this is that you you tied this dehumanizing sense of chaos and everybody doing what they want and having no sense of who the other is to the national breakdown. So is the answer to that in a way that you build the nation, you build the identity and you build the, the leader, you make the people a nation and that's what restores their humanity and ability to see the other as human beings? Or the opposite. What's the opposite? And the opposite is that you work on the interpersonal relations in your immediate 
circle and that that turns into a nation that is healthy, right? And that is is functional. Mm -hmm. All of this, again, somehow, you know, is all meant to bring about the king. So there's something that's going on simultaneously. But but there's another simultaneous thing, which is that Ruth is a Moabite. Yeah. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the, the the Moabite nation has a very strong connection um, to, let's say, if you go back to the story of Abraham, right, of, of Abraham, right? So the Moabite nation comes with Lot. And it, the initial, you know, the initial split between Abraham and Lot uh, takes place all the way back in Bereshit, right, in the book of Genesis, in the 13th chapter, when, you know, Lot and Abraham have, have, have been pretty much together. And at some point they separate and Lot goes to Stome. Okay. Now when Lot goes to Stome, it's really a questionable act because Stome, we're told right away, the Anche Stome Ra'im V'chata'im L'Hashem Ma'od. They're very evil. They're bad news from day one. They're bad news from day one. And, um, and Lot going there, one of the, I think, sort of questions in the story, which is never really explicitly answered, is what are the ramifications of Lot sort of throwing in his lot with these with with these really um, evil people, right? Who, who we have a lot of examples of their evil, which, you know, sort of seem to come out uh, in in the Jewish people in the book of Judges, right? So so Lot goes there, and he seems to act like Avraham, even in stone, right? He's bringing in all these guests. And so we say, oh, he, he retained that value system. But ultimately, of course, he becomes a product of his environment. And, uh, and from there... Moab is born. Now, Stom and Amara is it's pretty well known that Stom and Amara are completely annihilated, right? But w- w- there's one thing that 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 is born from Stom and Amora, and that is Moab and Ammon. And they they're are the spiritu- an answer? They're the way? spiritual heirs of Stom and Amara. They are not an answer. No. But Ruth becomes an answer. Ah, okay. So what what I what I was sort of getting at is that Ruth is the sort of historic closing of the circle. She returns to Avraham. Right? And she's the almost the I would I would call her the t- Tikkun for Lot. Um, and, and I think that the Bible hints to that because when Lot and Avram originally separate, the word that is used is parade, right? right? They separate one from the other. And when Ruth comes back to Naomi in that famous speech, right? Et cetera, et cetera, what does she say there? She says, um, Ki hamavet yafrid. She uses that word again. She says, only death do us part, right? That also comes from Ruth, that famous uh, line. But anyway, there's sort of a historical closing where she leaves behind that Moabite dysfunctional uh, society. But But I will say one other thing, and that is that in this way, Ruth, by leaving behind Moab, she also becomes the role model for the Israelites at the time to leave behind what they've become because they've in essence become that evil society that is, you know, sort of the archetypal evil society of Stom and Amara. That's where Am Yisrael is. Who's going to teach them to leave that? It's Root. So I now I know that you said you didn't write this book because of the, the, the um, central role of a woman figure. But I do feel like it's hard to avoid asking the question, do you not think there's any significance to the fact that this critical figure, this redemptive figure in Jewish life is a woman, that this whole book is, a, is about a woman as the protagonist, as the main character? Or maybe it's not truly really about her. Um, you know, maybe it's maybe it's really about the dead sons or Elimelech, you know, who is it really about? No, I, I would is even she... I, I ask it more bluntly and say that everything that you said now uh, could easily be categorized as, you know, a feminist critique of, of society. Why? It turns out that Gilad is more <laughs> feminist yeah. than me. That's yeah. a very feminist reading. No, it, it's, yeah. ju- it's, it's just that coming from this very rather conciliatory, inspirational... Um, emotional. Emotional, yeah. I mean, something that, you know, <laughs> and is also fundamentally seeking to change things for, for the better. Yeah. So, or, or also that maybe the qualities, the degenerate qualities of the previous version of society before she comes around maybe are associated with, you know, male violence. and. Yeah. I mean, the, the, for me, it really resonates, the, the, the feminist Although, you know, critique of today's, today's Israel. Yeah. But, you know, the funny thing is that our <laughs> listeners cannot see the faces Yael is making as we are trying so hard to put these gender <laughs> okay. analyses on just, this. Just forget That's it. Funny. No, no, don't <laughs> forget it. Let's hear Okay. It is a man's hear. world. You know, okay. I come back to what, what, you, what you originally said. Well, there's a couple of things. One is that I did not write the book because Ruth is a woman and I'm a woman. Um, I, I always sort of shied away from these 
I guess what what sounds to me like gender stereotypes um, or imposition uh, of modern analyses on ancient texts. Okay, maybe also. I mean, I like to teach the Bible. I like the Bible characters. I like the male characters in the Bible. I like the female characters in the Bible. And I don't consider all the females to be of one type and all the males to be of another type. I I do think that there is... First of all, I do think that Ruth is the heroine of the book. Of course, she's the eponymous heroine, right? The book is named after her. I also think that Boaz is an extraordinary figure in the book. He's an unusually um, positive figure. When you look at the Tanakh, when you look at the Bible... The Bible is quite critical of its heroic figures, which I think is extraordinary because what we have is an array of figures who are not being idealized and turned into superhumans. However, Boaz and Root, if you have any really almost completely positive characters, they are Boaz and Root. Now, coming back to the the gender question, I do think that there are some things that you could say about Root as a woman that, uh, that, that, function imp- that are important and and you know I don't know I don't know how other people feel about this but I do think that there is something about the determination for continuity that oftentimes we find also in the Bible um, lies with women uh, there are two significant stories where we see this one is we just finished celebrating Pesach right one is in the book of Shemot Right, in the beginning of the book of Exodus, when the, when the Jews are enslaved in Egypt, y- you have this sense that the women are working very hard to save those children who have been decreed against by Pharaoh. It's all women, right? It's the midwives, and it's the mother of the child, the mother of Moshe, right? And it's the sister of Moshe, and it's the daughter of Paro. What's she doing there, right? And they all you know, collaborate together to save the children. And the Midrash, right, has an extraordinary critique of the men in society at the time. There's a famous Midrash in which they ask pretty much, where's the father? They say, well, you know, the father divorced the mother. Amram divorced Yocheved, right? Why? Because he gave up. He said, well, this is an evil society. I don't want to bring children into this evil society. And he divorced his wife and he was a leader. So then all the men said, well, we're going to divorce our wives too. And they all divorced their wives. And then this is the Midrash, right? This isn't in the text, but this is, you know, a rabbinic attempt, I think, to try to mine the story for some of its deeper meanings. And then um, uh, Miriam, the daughter, goes to the father and says, you're worse than Paro. Right. And he says, what do you mean? And she says, well, because Paro decreed only against the boys, but your divorce decrees against any birth of any child. And so you've decreed against every. So in that story, I think part of what we're seeing is that sort of um, determination against all odds to continue having children, which I think often, you know, which I, I guess I guess, you know, that 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 might be considered to be a female trait. And, and maybe we're also seeing that in, in Miguelette Root. But I, I don't want to talk too much about, you know, uh, men are more inclined to war and women are more inclined to compassion. I, I, you know, I, I guess some of it, you know, I'll it doesn't totally. It, to... it doesn't really hold up in political science, by the way. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, very good. We're together. Again. Back together. Okay. <laughs> but I do want to be clear. I, I want to also go back a little bit to a character of Elimelech, which we, we haven't talked about so much. And you can tell us, but it sounds like he and the sons were punished on some level for having left the yeah. land. I mean, is this really more a story of human in, individual interactions, or is it more a story of nation and what happens when you abandon the nation, or is it some sort of statement that they are complementary, as you implied earlier? Yeah. Well, we know really very little about Elimelech and his sons. Um, I will say that rabbinic interpretation has very much seen Elimelech as a figure that shirks his leadership. And uh, by turning his back on society during a famine shows that he is not the kind of selfless leader that we're looking for, but rather one that is really looking out just for himself. And therefore, yeah, I mean, he is a Judean, right? He is from the leadership tribe. And he, of course, does belong to the family that eventually produces the king. So the the, the rabbinic interpreters tend to look at him as, you know, the, the king that could have been, um, but is not because of his lack of selflessness. So what really we are left with is a sense that we need leaders. We need leaders who are selfless, who think about tikkun, making the world a better place, and not only about their personal fortunes. And to that I say, 
Halavai. Yeah. With that, we will have to end, which is sad. But um, thank you so much for being here. We were talking with um, Dr. Yael Ziegler, whose book Ruth from Alienation to Monarchy came out in English by Magid Books. Um, and also a big thanks to Tammy Goldenberg, our sound engineer, and to the Van Leer Institute for their generous support. If you like this podcast, there are many more where it came from. Just go to www.tlv1.fm slash podcasts and take your pick or listen to all of them. All 300 of them. Exactly. <laughs> don't stop until you finished. And don't forget to visit our new website, Tel Aviv Review.org. Like us on Facebook and follow both Gilad and I on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. Goodbye.